Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment in our UXCX online series. Um, we have a fantastic lineup for you this evening, and I hope you're as excited to listen to it as I am. But just before we jump into the talks this evening, I want to give a very quick introduction to what it is that we do at UXCX and why we host these sessions. So at UXCX, our mission is to help companies shift from building software through waterfall projects to using autonomous empowered product teams. And why that's our kind of mission is because when you're dealing with high change environments, so we're not talking about software being built 20 years ago when things didn't change very frequently. When you're in a market where your competitors are constantly innovating and coming up with new things, you need your teams to know in depth what your customer needs are and how to kind of help them improve their ways of working. And that's why you need this team that's embedded, that's empowered to act on the information that they're learning about their customers. Now, that's a very easy thing to say that, oh, we'll just swap from doing waterfall projects to product teams. And a lot of the things that you're doing do stay the same, but a lot of things change as well. And that's why we host these sessions, because I'm sure there's lots of questions that come up. How are you supposed to change certain activities or how are things supposed to interact with each other? And our speakers are going to share their case studies and their examples of how they are changing their ways of working. It can hopefully help you see how you could apply that in your context. But if you do have any questions, the speakers will have some time to answer your questions as well. So please do kind of write them in the UXEX chat box that's on the side of the screen here or on YouTube, LinkedIn, whichever platform that you're watching this from. Sometimes we can't get to all the questions. And that's why we have the UXDX community Slack group. And in there, there's a channel called Ask the Speakers. So anything that we don't actually get time to talk through today, um, we'll put those questions in there. We'll invite the speakers to come and answer those questions as well. Um, and that can happen as well if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact. Please do join our, our Slack group, which you can find on our website, and then feel free to ask any questions. But that's enough above uh, my introduction. You're not here to listen to me. So I want to introduce our first speaker for the evening, and that is Jennifer Rose, who is um, going to be talking about the lessons learned in building a product in under four weeks that saved 10,000 lives. So I know um, we often think about our, our uh, products giving value, but, but this is definitely mm -hmm. true. So I'd like to introduce Jennifer. Thanks very much, Rory. And this is definitely going to be... Um, talking about how we had to change our ways of working throughout that process for sure. So um, I'm Jen. Uh, I am going to talk to you, as Rory said, about how to build a company that responds quickly to opportunities and save 10,000 lives in the process. So just a bit of a run through of uh, cover today. So agenda, I'm going to cover who I am, why I'm here, and the three steps that I kind of think are the main takeaways that I had from going through this process of building this product, which are don't wait to be told what to build, create resilient teams that can pivot quickly, and act fast when problems arise. So I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But for now, um, briefly, I'm Jen. Uh, so my original background was working for charities in kind of customer service and donor experience teams. And like everyone else I know who now works in product, I fell into it as a career. So I started working at a startup. Uh, employee number four, which means I was doing bits of everything, basically. And after a while, uh, an opportunity came up to move into product, which really excited me to move away from just reporting on problems that our customers were having and having some part in being able to say what we built next and how we solved those problems. So I've now been in product for seven years. Um, I am currently overseeing all things product in New Look. I just started there this year. So in that kind of new new job glow, um, but I'm not here to, to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about my previous role at Accurex, who are a healthcare startup who builds software for the NHS. Um, and specifically um, one product of the kind of few that I worked on while I was there, but there's one in particular that I'm here to talk to about today. And that's because it helped 30 million people get their COVID vaccines. It's actually now being used for COVID and flu every year, um, but that's probably a story for another day. Um, and the timing was really important here as well. So AccuBook, the name of the product that I'm going to be talking to you around, ended up having a massive impact on the vaccination program rollout. 
and how quickly GPs and, and primary care were able to ramp up to millions of patients getting their COVID jabs. And you, you may remember this way back when, and we're going to cast our mind back to the wonderful year of 2020. So this is AccuBook. This is a, a screenshot from the product as it was built. Um, and this is a kind of almost behind the scenes. So where GP users were uploading patient lists, getting text sent out to patients, and then using it to follow up with those who weren't responding. Um, and you may have never heard of it. Acubit, this might be the first time you're ever hearing about it, but you may have used it as a user. And if you've got a text to book in for your um, vaccinations, uh, you may well have got that from us because we did end up uh, sending texts to I think about a third of the population they used us to get booked in. And in fact, if you've ever had a, a text from your GP, chances are it was from us as well. Um, I say us as Acurex. Um, we were the first company that were sending patients texts to book in for their vaccinations. And I think a few others followed suit after that. So as I said, the kind of impact that we ended up with was over 30 million vaccines booked through our software, um, which amounts to over 10,000 lives saved. I think it ended up as uh, more than that, that we're trying to think about how many people didn't get COVID, didn't get into hospitals, et cetera. So kind of talk about impact. It's definitely the most impactful thing I'm sure I will ever work on in, as my, in my career as a product person. So like I said, let's take our minds back to that wonderful year of 2020. Um, at the end of 2020, the vaccinations program was very much on the way. And you may remember headlines like these. Um, if you're in the UK at the time around vaccinations getting approved and ready for rollout, and there was lots of back and forth and unknowns about when it was going to happen, how are they getting approved, all those kind of things. And in early November, it became really clear that primary care and GP um, play a massive part in this COVID, COVID vaccine rollout. And they were going to be the main delivery sites for vaccines, but without much notice. And they, in fact, had to change their ways of working because they had to start working together in hubs, um, something which they're still doing today because it worked really well, but they had to go through loads of change management. And so we started talking to them about how they, how they were planning to run this along their day-to-day -day service, which they couldn't drop either. Um, and there was one quote that kept coming out again and again when we were talking to GPs. And that was, we don't have the tech to do this. They'd never done it before. Um, it was going to be the biggest vaccination effort in UK history and the technology and processes that they currently had at their disposal just wouldn't have cut it, especially the scale and the speed we were talking about. So the only option they turned to was people, hiring people and, and getting people to call. And this photo might be exaggerating a little bit, but it's not actually that far from the truth. The, the plan was to use lists of patients, getting staff to call them individually to get them booked into the system or even send letters to book them into the appointment books for their vaccines. And that was the GPs that are actually a bit more advanced. The more GPs would be using pen and paper and calling people one by one. And that wouldn't have scaled us to, like I said, we were really talking about optimizing for speed here. How many people can we get vaccinated quickly? And so it really wasn't gonna cut it. And so we knew there had to be a better way. And so we were already really well set up for this because we had been building software for GPs and working really closely with them for a couple of years at that point. And so we wanted to build something that would speed up that process of getting patients booked in. We knew that was going to be the bottleneck. And so we built a product that was able to send text to many patients at once so that they could self-serve. And the timelines we had were really, really tight. And it's something that's not that fun to have in product when you actually have a timeline and a deadline doesn't work that well with Agile sometimes. Um, so we started talking to practices in November and trying to figure out how we could help and what they knew about what they had to do. And we made that decision to build AccuBook on the 13th of November. And so in terms of those timelines, we knew we had to have something live kind of by Christmas. We knew the next national vaccine program was really beginning in earnest and that massive ramp up of new practices delivering vaccines was happening in the new year which left us about seven weeks in the middle, which already we were a bit panicked about. But luckily we were set up really well and we got something live even sooner than that. So we smashed those targets. We had a demo webinar, which kind of worked. There was a bit of manual stuff behind the scenes on the 5th of December. And then we actually went live with our MVP, our minimal viable product, in on the 10th of December. So that was just five days after demoing that prototype. 
And then five days after that, we had booked in over 10,000 patients. So we'd had 10,000 users through our software on the patient side, which of course we were so, so thrilled with. We we're so happy that that happened. And like I said at the beginning, there's three steps or three key takeaways that I always come back to in terms of why we were able to do it so quickly. And we learned a ton and there's lots of stuff we didn't do so well, some of the things I'll cover today. But the three steps were don't wait to be told what to build, create resilient teams that can pivot quickly, and act fast when those problems arise. So I'm gonna go into that first one. Don't, be wait, don't wait to be told what to build. So we are and already were experts in our field. So at Accurex, they hire doctors to work with product teams and work really closely with their product teams. So you can see here Vivek, Satya and Lucy, who were our three clinical leads at the time. So their job's really to make sure that what the product teams are building or even just thinking about building will actually solve problems for our users. And they also make sure what we're building is clinically safe. Uh, so Vivek there on the left is a GP, which means he was able to give us kind of immediate insight on those first thoughts about building AccuBook and really quickly validate, no, that won't work because this is how GPs do a thing or this is the tech you're trying to integrate with. And that fit really nicely with user research. It was already the backbone of our product process. We were already able to just start following our normal process delivery. So that didn't really feel like much of a change to our ways of working. We just had to condense it and speed it up a little bit. And this is an image from Dovetail, which is a software we use, uh, software we use to record and store all of our user research. And it was really nice to have a digital record to come back to later on. So we could say, oh, what did they say about um, walk-ins or, you know, what happens when the system goes down? Let's go back and have a look. And it saved us having to go back and do more research because we already had some of those insights. The thing that changed for us and the thing that we really had to adapt our, our ways of working on was that this wasn't a time where users could tell us what they needed or we couldn't ask questions to prompt some of those user needs. When we talked to them about things, they said, we're not sure yet, we're going to get told soon. Or we have no idea what the DNA, so did not attend rate will be yet. We're thinking low, we'll copy what we did for flu and learn as we go. So it wasn't something that we were able to pull from those user needs and figure out what problem we had to solve. We had to make sure instead that we were the experts on the topic. So even before we made the decision to build AccuBook, we did lots of research into the vaccination rollout program. And you can see here in November the 11th, we published a white paper. And this was really key for success because it meant we could help our users. And instead of having to build something that catered to the hundreds of edge cases and different ways practices could roll out vaccines, we could guide them in best practice and say, here is how you use this product. So we could be a lot more opinionated about those workflows. If we weren't really embedded, and I can still reel off the difference between the gap for Pfizer versus AstraZeneca, that's gonna stay in my mind forever. But because we were able to do that, we were able to make hard decisions for our users and it paid off for us. So we saw numbers ramp up really quickly after releasing the MVP. And yes, there was definitely some stuff that we had to tweak and iterate on the go. But most of the time we could see that those assumptions that we were making because they were so well researched and educated actually did pay off for us. So that was the first big learning that we had. The second one was around teams. So creating resilient teams that can pivot quickly. And this was obviously a lot of what we already had set up that worked really well. So the team structure we have here might look quite familiar. Um, this is how Accurate structures product teams like many others. Each team is multidisciplinary, which means they're able to work as a independent unit towards their goals. So at Accurex, we give them lots of autonomy to make decisions on how they work. So do they want a Kanban board or not? Do they want to work in sprints or not? It's really up to them. We judge them on moving metrics, team health, um, and shipping things, basically. And alongside that, this is really what our teams look like. This is the structure, it's really what they look like. So we ended up giving teams time to be teams. So this has meant they got to know each other. What are their quirks? How do they like to work? Which we'll come back to a bit later on as well. So we really encouraged our teams to give themselves an identity. So it's really important that they knew why they're a team, what their mission was, and how they're going to work together to get there. So that might be formulating working agreements or how we like to work documents that they could all share and buy into. 
And that one on the left there, Empire Strikes Vax, that was one of our, um, the cycle names. So, you know, some of the work we were doing for the vaccinations team. So it was all nice and themed as well. And teams also set their own vision, roadmap and OKRs. So this was really helpful for them, like I said, to know where they're going and what their mission was, where, how, what metrics we were going to judge them on. And a really key way to communicate that to the rest of the company. So everyone else knew this was the most important thing we're working on and this is why. And we may have asked the team to change what they were doing and for something new, but we wouldn't also ask them to change who they were doing it with as well. So it doesn't mean to say that teams always get to decide what they work on. Sometimes, like this example, a new company priority came up. So vaccinations or a new time sensitive thing that they would be told, you're going to, do you want to work on this thing? And we may ask them to change that, but we wouldn't also then change who they were doing that thing with. So with AccuBook, although we had to shift with a couple of days notice onto something new, we did it as a unit already knowing those people. So we didn't have to spend time getting to know each other as well. And we also made it really clear to the rest of the company what we're thinking about and then what we decided to do. And so I was constantly sharing updates in our, you can see here, it's our general Slack channel to everyone. Come and join our Slack channel if you want to know more, um, making sure everything was really clear to everyone else what we were doing and why. And this was quite important because it meant that when team members were being asked to do things like interviews, they, you know, they knew they were working on something that was really time dependent and it freed up lots of time. It meant I didn't have to shield them from that. Everyone knew what we were working on. And all of this added up to having a really high level of psychological safety in the team and a really open, honest communication, which meant every, I went around to every team member and said, do you want to work on this vaccinations product? It's going to be really intense. It's going to be really tight timelines. I knew that answer was genuine when they said they were ready and they wanted to. They considered it. They said, yes, they're ready to go. So we had to make a handbrake turn to work on something new, but we did it as a team and it didn't break us. We didn't have to, like I said, go through learning how to work with each other again. We could really hit the ground running and get shit done from day one. And like I said, it's how we judge our PMs. It was something in our progression. So a big part of being a PM at AccuRx is leading a high-performing team. And if you're interested in learning more about this, by the way, you can Google and find AccuRx progression framework, and you can have a look and read through a lot more about that. So that was our kind of big second point um around teams and making sure that the team worked together really well and then the last section um is all around acting fast and acting quickly when problems arise and believe me we had lots of problems along the way and even before we started building we knew the importance of moving fast as a company and how to place those decisions around moving fast as well so this screenshot here is a a, a meeting around vaccine go no go so senior leaders in the company, our CEO, co-founders got together and said, should we do this thing or not? Because it had lots of implications. It meant taking a team off of doing something else. We knew it would pull in loads of other teams as well. It wouldn't just be this team that got affected. It would affect pretty much everyone else in the business. There are about um, 50 of us at this point, and everyone in some way was touched by us working on this thing. And so there was this go, no go meeting and you can see the timing of this. And then pretty much not that long after that, I got a message from my VP product, Benji, um, saying vaccine is go. So that line, line in the sand was drawn in that meeting. We are doing this thing. And then we had to take that mentality forward with us, make a decision and act really quickly off the back of that. The same as we had to do when we figured out stuff from our users on the fly. Cool. Make a decision and off we go. So that same day, straight after the vaccine, story mapping later on that day. So this was us that same day, hybrids, some of us in office, some of us remote, getting into a room, virtual room, and running a story mapping session to decide what would go into our MVP and what would be left out. And it was really interesting to do a story mapping when you had this tight deadline as well versus just a what's the leanest way we can do this. We also had to think about feasibility for timelines. So I'm not going to go too much into what story mapping is here. If you haven't read Jeff's book, I'd really, really recommend it. Um, it's a great tool for deciding the scope of an MVP, as well as a great communication and stakeholder to tool as well. And kind of, you know, one of the things here about talking about how we had to shift those ways of working, it soon became really obvious that 
how we were setting things up and how we were doing things for our normal product life wasn't going to work here. It wasn't going to cut it for us and how we were working and how flexible we needed to be. So in normal times, I was catching up with my tech lead, Mike, twice a week. We worked in sprints and we set weekly goals for the team. So a nice normal cadence. But due to the fast paced nature of what we were working on, this really didn't give us enough flexibility. And me as the PM, I was talking to our users on support. I was you know, making sure on Google, I knew all of the things that were coming from the NHS. So we were finding new things about guidance every day. And so that was either something that was validating some of those assumptions we'd made earlier on, was going against it and we were wrong, or it was absolutely new information. And from our users on research calls as well. So this is an example of what how all of that added up to Mike and I trying to figure out how to rework our processes on the fly. And again, we'd spent enough time together to have that psychological safety with, it, with each other for him to say, I don't think that session went really well, that we'd run together. Let's figure out how to do that. And we were able to figure out um, a way of working. So we quickly found new ways of working. Um, and again, because we gave teams autonomy, it meant we were able as a team to go off and change all of our ways of working. We didn't get to have to get sign off or change new tools or anything like that. We could just pivot however we wanted to get the job done. So we changed to daily goals and daily syncs. I think during this time period up until Christmas, I spent more time with my tech league, Mike, than my husband, still a bone of contention. Um, but we had to make sure we were aligned for all of the important bits for that day. It wasn't good enough to say where we needed to be by the end of the week. For us to keep to those deadlines, we needed to make sure everyone knew what was the most important thing that day. And so we also made sure we kept an open dialogue like this to make sure we could review and improve how we were working. This is just one example of those kind of messages that would go back and forth between us to say, that worked better, I'm going to go off and do this. One of the big mistakes I made um, was starting to skip some of our, our cadence and starting to skip some of those rhythm ceremonies that we have all the time. So I was really passionate about giving teams time back and making sure they didn't have to context switch as much as possible. What that meant was I said, let's skip a couple of retros. We know what we're working on. We'll come back and do a bigger one later on. And what this added up to was making sure that we didn't have time to talk about how overwhelmed and overworked the team were feeling. And we began to burn out. It was becoming clear that people had less energy and they were starting to feel burnt out by the stress and long hours they were having to put in. I'm sure you remember that time as well. There was nothing to do. You couldn't go out unless you wanted to go onto another Zoom and do a family quiz. You might as well keep working, especially when it really felt like we were doing something so important. It became really hard to switch off. And I remember that feeling well, and I'm sure you all do as well. It wasn't something that was unique to us. So we really quickly reestablished our retros. And this is uh, some, of the, some of the output from that. This was our retro we did. Um, and from the off, I remember feeling like, oh, God, we should never have stopped doing these. It became clear how much the team were working evenings and weekends. And some of the stuff there that really made my heart sink was a feeling like they couldn't take breaks because they were missing something. And obviously, that wasn't what we wanted. And we didn't want the team to feel like that. And it was obviously going to be very unsustainable. So what we also did was make sure we reset those expectations. And again, the key here was to really act quickly off of the back of that information. So how could we make sure that the team could take breaks, work in a more sustainable way, while also making sure we delivered that important product for GPs? It was an intense period. That wasn't going to change. So I kind of alluded to it earlier, but we came up with a how are we working right now document. So every member of the team shared some helpful info around what times of the day they'd be working and when they're uncon uncontactable for breaks as well. So you can see here that last one around, I try and sync before 5.30, I want to make time for my family. So this really helped them communicate with each other to say, this is when I'm not around and that's okay. So it was okay for some people to say, I'm actually working more evenings. That's absolutely fine. But it made sure that we made sure everyone had breaks and they were getting downtime as well. And you can see here, it then very quickly fostered a culture of sharing breaks and encourage, encouraging others to do the same, which for me was really great to see from feeling like I'd let the team down because they all felt guilty for taking breaks. Then we shifted really quickly into a, a, a culture of really encouraging that and celebrating each other for doing so. And 
in that thread is a few photos from walks that people had to say, look, I'm out and here I am, here's a pond, I think was that one, um, which was really great to be able to solve that problem. And then the next thing happened, we went live, which was great, but then our support team became overwhelmed. Kind of the intense period went from us to them and obviously including us for changing bugs and things like that. Accubic was probably the most complex product that Accurex had supported especially because we'd had to be quite strict about some of the ways of, you know, being strict. So we didn't have that flexibility in some places. So we had loads of incoming requests around what we're building, what features would come next. And users were just trying to get set up. That took time. So our support team became a lot busier. So what did we do? We doubled our team. So we went from having people kind of chip in from other teams. Like I said, it affected everyone to doubling our support team. Very luckily, we're a startup with funding to do this. Um, and we could hire new people in two days um, from having that problem to getting people coming in. And all that meant was very quickly, we said, get a job ad up, we need more people in. So by the end of the next week, we had some more people trained up and it wasn't as intense a period for that team. And I could carry on talking about uh, different examples of where we had to pivot quickly. Uh, I'm very happy to answer some in the Q&A as well. Um, but just to recap where we were before. So our three steps to success, if you have some takeaways from this, are don't wait to be told what to build. If you're in this scenario where you're having to move really quickly, make sure you know your users really well already. Create resilient teams that can pivot quickly. Keeping that team together that's already high performing is going to me mean you're going to move much quicker than forming a team on that day one. And three, act fast when those problems arise. So don't wait to talk about what could we do here. Make sure you have a culture where you can make decisions really quickly and autonomy for people to make decisions so that that problem doesn't remain a problem for a long time. And the last thing I just wanted to share is how incredibly proud we are of what we've built. And I'm not showing you these to tell you how great it was and how everyone said we were perfect, but because this was really how we were judging ourselves as a team, that impact we were having. And what we set out to do was help primary care when it needed it most. A lot of these quotes you can talk, you can see here talk about how fast they were able to put patients in compared to what they would have had without a vacuum book, which is absolutely fantastic. And that one in the top right, even talking about how the product helped not waste a thousand vaccines. Like I said at the beginning, I don't think I'm ever going to have uh, another product to work on that has as high impact as this. And we did have a massive impact, and hence why I'm still talking about this and riding on the coattails two years later. Uh, so this is from one week in January 2021, um, commenting on kind of how through AccuBook we help support the NHS in giving the 25,000 years of extra life. Um, so obviously we were one small part, and I'm not going to pretend we are why it was successful, but we are incredibly proud and I'm incredibly proud of being a small part of a bigger picture of the vaccination program. Um, and yeah, I'm sure I'll be talking about it for years to come. <laughs> uh, so that was all I wanted to go through. Uh, thanks very much. And I think there's a couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions. Yes, thanks very much. And that was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, I, I like to, you're kind of touching the nail on a lot of what, what we talk about UXCX of like the empowered teams, the autonomy, the um, things like that. I, I have just one quick question. If anybody has any questions, please do, do post them in. Um, we have about a minute, so I'll, I'll try and make it quick. Sometimes when people are under pressure and you move to that daily goals, mm. that can actually become a burden on the team because it's kind of, you have somebody tapping people on the shoulder every few minutes going, where are we with this? Where are we with this? So mm. how did you make sure that when you went down to that level of granularity of updates that you weren't distracting the team, just constantly asking them for updates instead of letting them do the work? Yeah, good question. I think some of that was the role of the tech lead and having someone who was kind of breaking that down. Um, so being able to work with the engineers together to say, how can we break down these tasks? What do we think is most important? And then the second thing is almost having the daily goals in, in this experience kind of worked as the opposite. So it was very much giving sometimes that daily goal would be on one person and it would be a kind of cool Ravi, let's take an example of one of the engineers. Ravi is the most important thing to get done. What that meant at stand up was other people were saying, Ravi, can I help you with that? Is there anything you need? Do you want me to take that meeting for you? So that experience, and I think again, because the team knew each other really well, 
it almost acted as the shield or buffer to say, I've finished my thing. Ravi, do you need anything before I pick anything else up? So it kind of corralled the team around that most important task. Not always. And it, it does feel like that pressure, especially at the end of the day when you've got your daily task and you're trying to figure out whether it was done or not. But um, mostly it was a good shield. Excellent. Um, well, I, I do have um, some people are saying thanks for, for sharing on, on the chat. Um, I have one or two other questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I might post them into the, the Slack channel. I'll invite you to, to answer those questions there as well. But thanks very thank much. you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. So up next, we have Stephen um, Labanio. I, I forgot to ask Stephen how to pronounce his name. So apologies, Stephen, about that. Um, but Stephen will be talking about circular design to scale lasting change. And this is, I guess, a, a really interesting space. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in circular design as well. So welcome, Stephen. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Rory. Let me share screen now. Okay, over to you, Stephen. Thank you. So imagine if we could bring the best of emerging technology and human-centered design to drive collective action that can help to protect the future of one of our planet's greatest natural resources. Hi, every director at the DOC, Accenture's Global Center of Innovation based in Dublin. And today I'm gonna to speak about Reef Cloud. It's a collaborative intelligent platform to improve coral reef monitoring and preservation efforts on a global scale. And there are three key things that are like Firstly, it's the outcomes from this purpose-driven project. Secondly, the circular design process that we used. And thirdly, how we amplified the work to create impact. And to begin, I'll play a short video. A picture says a thousand words, and it can tell us about our coral reefs. More than half a billion people depend on reefs for food, income and protection. They are also critical to the survival of a quarter of the world's fish. Around the world, we analyze pictures to inform the way we manage and protect our reefs. But climate change is accelerating the impact of many of the threats our reefs face faster than we can monitor them. To bring together coral reef monitoring efforts from around the world, leading scientists in Australia and the Pacific work together to develop Reef Cloud. Reef Cloud harnesses the power of human collaboration and artificial intelligence to equip us with the latest and best information about the state of our reefs. Building on automated data management, artificial intelligence, and statistical analyses, Reef Cloud can estimate reef composition 700 times faster, meaning we have the latest information within days rather than months or years. Reef Cloud integrates information from many users and provides an easy go-to platform for the latest insights. Our reefs are facing their greatest challenge. By working together, we can help give them a fighting chance. Find out more at reefcloud.ai. So Accenture first started working with the Australian Institute of Marine Science, or AIMS, in 2019. And the idea originated at a hackathon, which led to a six-week rapid innovation sprint at the dock, and during which time we discovered that AIMS was exploring a similar concept. So AIMS had thousands of images from which they were struggling to derive benefit. And the findings from this phase were very promising. So we continue to expand our work with AIMS in 2020, conducting systems-led research, creating new AI models, defining a value narrative and partner strategy, as well as conducting a series of rapid experiments. And then we transition the project to other parts of Accenture to scale Reef Cloud. So at the dock, we understood that this is a challenge which requires collective action. And we also found that the purpose-driven mission at the core was key in helping us to expand the team and grow a support network. And while we were working within a constrained budget, many people offered to help as a plus one activity as they were excited by the opportunity. And our previous speaker, Jennifer, described really eloquently about growing a culture of psychological safety and working nimbly to develop high-performing teams. 
And these ways of working were core to the success of the ReefPlow project. So we joined forces with other parts of Accenture, Applied Intelligence, Perth Innovation Hub, Fjord Sydney, advertising agency, The Monkeys, and Accenture Development Partnerships. And our team brought capabilities across data and analytics, design, strategy, and innovation. And we also grew connections with non-governmental organizations working in the ocean space. For example, the World Wildlife Federation, the Ocean Conservancy, and the World Resources Institute. And we then started engaging technology partners such as Amazon AWS and Mapbox. But we faced a number of key challenges along the journey that stretched the team and it forced us to find creative solutions. So these include cultural change. So there's a need for a mindset shift on, of, around purpose-driven initiatives to help move leaders in this space from intentions to action. And this is so important to increase the pace of progress. An initial mis mistake that we made was assuming that senior leadership would buy in and support and in reality, this took significant time to help educate stakeholders and communicate how a broader set of value levers can deliver business and societal value. Secondly, around funding access. So initial difficulties in securing funding led us to explore non-traditional challenges. For example, awards bursaries to prove enough value to unlock further funding. And thirdly, around remote co-creation. So the project was run during COVID lockdowns and we didn't get to meet the client face-to-face so we used custom design working sessions to align and co-create frequently. And then the fourth key challenge was around time zones. So we had a client base in Australia. We distributed team members across Ireland and the US. And on that basis, we, we took it in turns in terms of what we described as the graveyard shift in, in terms of that no, no one uh, location was, was always inconvenienced around that, that we, we spread the load among the team. And then in terms of the approach that we took to, to solving these challenges, so that the, the nature of this specific challenge and other challenges that clients are bringing to the doc are becoming increasingly complex. And as innovators, we need to evolve our skill sets to help clients navigate complexity and drive lasting scalable change. Recently, a European Commission report estimated that 80% of a product or services environmental impact is determined during the design stage. And I'm really passionate about the role and the opportunity for design in creating a brighter future. And for this project, I adapted a framework created by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and identified key methods to help to explore, define, develop, and deliver from a circular perspective. And I'll explain how this process was key to the success of ReefCloud. So the first stage, explore, focused on defining an agile systems thinking research approach. And the starting point was to gain understanding of the interdependencies in the marine ecosystem to help maximize the impact of reef cloud and to focus efforts for coral reef preservation. We took a collaborative approach to foster engagement, designing interactive working sessions with marine biologists and divers. We then conducted a series of experiments to help synthesize. So to gain understanding of the, of the elements that impact coral health and how they're connected, we create a model known as a concept map and this helped us identify what we knew, what we'd like to learn, and how to articulate AIM's vision. And in this map, the elements are portrayed by the circular nodes, the connections are portrayed by the lines, and the current state is represented by the green nodes, and then the intended future state of Reef Cloud is represented by the purple nodes. We created an interactive version of this map to allow to, us to explore clusters of nodes and analyze the connections, and it was really valuable as it helped us identify central themes for the research. For example, environmental change, collecting data, describing data, synthesizing data, and influencing. And we investigated these themes further in later experiments. And then based on the understanding of the connections between the elements and some core themes, we next investigated cause and effect by creating a causal loop diagram. And our research on the current state of the marine ecosystem identified that a reinforcing cycle of social and environmental change with over 500 million livelihoods at risk as a result of coral bleaching is leading to action. For example, over tourism, pollution, urbanization that increases coral reef degradation where 75% of the world's reefs are critically endangered. 
And that in turn accelerates change in the marine ecosystem where 25% of marine life is in danger. And current attempts to rebalance the system create a second reinforcing cycle where the rate of coral reef degradation leads to pressure on the speed of data collection, which is slow and inefficient. So divers collect vast amount of images for monitoring activities, but they have no efficient way to tag or upload the images. And marine biologists have to manually annotate hundreds of pixels per image. And they, they struggle to derive insights or trends due to lack of connected data sources. And they then manually create reports based on scarce insights, restricting the ability to generate awareness or influence decision makers. And these factors indirectly contribute to overall coral degradation. Reef cloud will attempt to balance this reinforcing cycle that's detrimental to the health of marine life. It introduces foundational aspects such as standardized data organization and enhanced annotation to enable faster data collection and generation of richer insights and trends. And based on this, machine learning models can be trained to predict outcomes. And this ability can help to influence economic and environmental policy, inform action, and rebalance the rate of societal and environmental change. And key opportunities for Accenture were identified around data organization and labeling, faster, more accurate annotation, generation of trends, and the ability to predict outcomes. In the defined stage, we leveraged our research findings to define the North Star vision, value narrative, and partner engagement approaches. And we also focused on auditing the user experience, prioritizing future state features, and co-creating concepts. So how we shaped our understanding around cause and effect helped us to define the future vision for Reef Cloud. And the vision aims to outpace climate change in two ways. So firstly, is to support the global integration of monitoring efforts by defining best practice methods, growing awareness, and collating a really robust data set. And then secondly, to influence policy by creating that single source of truth, democratizing data access, and using modeling to predict future outcomes. We also created a narrative that considered the value of reefs from environmental, societal, and economic perspectives. And coral reefs are a vital part of the Earth's ecosystem. And the death of coral reefs represents a huge loss, as much as $375 billion annually for the local economies that they support globally, and the loss of habitat for a vast number of creatures that depend on the reefs. But the economic value of healthy coral reefs is staggering. A recent World Wildlife Federation report estimated potential net benefit streams of 30 billion US dollars per year if reefs were well managed and intact. To address these challenges and to take advantage of these opportunities, building strategic partnerships is vital. And we identified more than 50 partners from a market scan, and we grouped them into part partner archetypes. And we identified seven metrics to rank the strength of synergies and engagement potential. And we also conducted portfolio deep dives into 17 high priority partners and 17 medium priority partners and created an outreach plan for pre and post product launch. And the initial partner engagement strategy focused on funding and technology partners to enhance the pilot, to add additional detection capabilities, provide offline and, and mobile functionality, and to integrate external data sets. And we also synthesized overall research findings to surface key pain points and root causes. And we then co-created with the AIMS team on future state features to address root causes and augment the user experience. And we asked the AIMS team to rank the features based on perceived value. And a key learning here was that the most desirable features broadly covered a flexible annotation process, a method for identifying algae, which was described as the holy grail by the, the client due to the difficulty of distinguishing algae from coral, and then the ability to intuitively analyze and report on data insights. So we ran a series of experiments based on these, um, these prioritized features, and we focused on developing that partner engagement strategy to secure the long-term viability of this initiative. 
focused on testing high priority opportunities for desirability and feasibility, creating low fidelity mockups to iterate concepts at pace, and also in-depth scenario tests to bring the concepts to life. So this included a UI concept to bring the features to life. And we've, we firstly focused on analysis and reporting features. And we conducted scenario tests and surveys on, on low to medium fidelity designs. And we found this to be a highly effective way of rapidly iterating concepts. The design analytics teams also co-created a future state annotation experience that was designed to ease the burden on marine experts. And this approach improves the speed, accuracy, and efficiency of the annotation process, reducing cognitive load with guided workflows. And the key features here include flexibility to select manual or automated annotation, the option to set confidence thresholds based on the extent to which the data set has been trained by AI models, the ability to quickly and easily paint similar segments rather than manually annotating hundreds of pixels per image. And then also contextual prompts on car species based on machine learning. And this new flow enables tasks to be completed in just a few clicks. And a key learning here is the combination of automatic methods and human insight offers a smoother annotation process with a more thorough result. We also ran a series of technology focused experiments, for example, image segmentation to define coral health, the ability to distinguish algae from dead coral, optimizing the cloud architecture to reduce overall cost. That was their previously their biggest monthly outgoing and then enhancing the infrastructure pipeline to improve security. And the work led by the doc in the explore and define stages was then transitioned to Accenture applied intelligence for the develop phase. And this phase focused on advancing concepts with rapid user testing and iteration, refining the brand experience, creating high fidelity designs, and supporting UI specifications. And during the beta phase, we rapidly tested and iterated designs with over 200 users across 24 countries. And this includes scientists and managers from Australia, Fiji, Palau, Vanuatu, and the Maldives, We've been closely collaborating with NGOs, universities, and government organizations to ensure that individual needs are considered. So from local stakeholders, for example, indigenous communities, marine parks, state managers, to national and international bodies, for example, national ministries and international science advisory networks. And in terms of the, the look and feel and the personality of the product, a brand style was developed using color to emphasize key information and KPIs on coral health and change over time. For example, and highlighting controls that allow users to quickly navigate to different spatial levels or save and export selections. And ReefCloud also includes subtle animations and parallax scrolling to create a rich user experience. And finally, the scale stage focused on launching ReefCloud publicly, gathering client feedback, and amplifying the work to maximize impact and gain wider support. So ReefCloud was launched publicly at the Our Ocean Conference in Palau in April 2022. And so what's next? Well, from a circularity perspective, we've identified three key dimensions to focus on to ensure the long-term viability of ReefCloud. So firstly, it's about strengthening the core platform, including UX enhancements, mobile functionality, data interoperability, additional applications of machine learning, for example, new species and new diseases in other geographical locations. Horizon 2 is looking at building tangential applications, for example, application of AI algorithms in coral nurseries, augmenting computer vision to identify other indicators of ecosystem vitality, integration with public fishery and monitoring systems. And then the third horizon is around platform monetization. So this includes integration with carbon market mechanisms, custom-made tourism applications, 
for example, diving or hotel experiences, and then utility for supply chain ESG monitoring. So our client and thought partner on this initiative, Dr. Manuel Gonzalez Rivero, has described the work as the biggest breakthrough he's had to date. We finally got to meet him. Uh, so after uh, a significant time of working remotely uh, and on, on many working sessions and, uh, and, and conference calls, he visited the dock in July uh, the, of last year. And I, I, I think it, it really helped to, you know, to, to further deepen the, the relationship uh, between Accenture and Ames. We're, we're working with him in, on the, you know, the, the future vision with, with this now a, a live platform of how can we ins ensure the long-term viability? How can we look at um, sharing best practices? How can we look at continuing to grow that, that partner ecosystem? And on this work, it's not just the scientific community that's taken notice. So an Accenture global media release and coverage from 15 international media outlets has raised the profile internally and externally. And additionally, industry experts such as Richard Vivers and Vincent Knifel have become strong advocates for the program. And if I was to call out any one factor that was key to the success of the initiative, it would be the approach that we took to amplification in terms of growing awareness getting buy-in, proving value, it had a ripple effect. It really started to generate momentum for the project. And those are key learnings that I will take to, to when we're working on future wicked challenges going forward. And then beyond the scientific community, ReefCloud has won sustainability awards at the Asia Pacific Spatial Excellence Awards, the Irish Design Institute Awards, it also won an award at the Accenture Eco Innovation Challenge in 2021, which helped to generate funding to scale the platform and provide access to mentoring support from Accenture subject matter experts. And then more recently, ReefCloud was recognized at the Fast Company Awards World Changing Ideas in 2022. Coral reefs are home to one quarter of the plant's marine life and are facing their greatest challenge. And with ReefCloud, we aim to give them a fighting chance. So I look forward to evolving the circular design principles I learned from this project and applying them to address other wicked societal challenges. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll open to any questions. Great. Thank you, Stephen. That was um, really interesting. I, I kind of, it's one of those problem spaces that I never even knew existed. <laughs> <laughs> until until I heard you talking about it, but it, it, it kind of makes sense that it, it, um, it's good to see that, that some progress is being made in that area. Um, so yeah, if anybody does have any questions, please do um, write them in. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll keep the ball rolling again. Um, so one thing that um, I was kind of, just when you were going through your phases, your research to find deliver, you were showing in the define phase is when you showed the demo and, and things like that. So what is your distinction between define and deliver? Because it, I would have assumed now, now there's two things that have jumped into my head. The first was that was all just a prototype and smoke and mirrors, or you're actually building through the define phase. Yeah, it, it, it's a, a super question. So when, when we work on projects, we we commonly uh, define short, sharp phases to prove enough value. So, so scope the work, experiment, test, prove value, refine. And so in, in the defined stage that you were speaking to there, it was we were building on our, our research understanding. We were looking to take our hypotheses, test them, bring some of the key opportunity areas or features to life. And, and at that early stage, uh, to test with different groups of users. So, so whether it was divers, whether it was um, uh, policymakers, external stakeholders, bring them to the, those wider group of, of stakeholders, get their reactions refined. So th th those early stage scenario tests might, would have been created by a, a, a combination of us um, co-creating with the client of design teams, analytics teams, software teams working really closely together to help bring those features to life so that there's um, 
because what we're testing there for is desirability, feasibility, and viability, and also in this sustainability space for, if we want to call it integrity or responsibility as well, that those are four key vectors that we included as, as part of our process for testing. And, and we were looking to, to make sure that we had, you know, just enough robustness I, as, as part of our approach to, to make sure we could stand over the work, br bring it to those different groups, test, get the reactions, refine and, and move on. So that, that's to your, your question there in terms of the level to which it was smoke and mirrors are fully developed. I, I'd, the way I would frame it is we, we started lo-fi, we rapidly iterated and tested. As we gathered feedback, we gradually iterated that to, to medium fidelity, to building out scenario tests. And then once we, we validated with, with wider groups, that's where we started to, 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 to create those, those full flows to, to start full development uh, around that. Because there's a huge amount of, of research from a technical perspective that went into this, for example, in terms of looking at uh, mapping at different spatial levels and how to navigate users through that and, and how to then develop custom reports off the back of that. So I, for me, I think it was the, the level of close collaboration across the team really helped us to move at pace. So it's kind of almost a blurring of there isn't like a hard and fast defined deliver boundary. The, the, it, 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 I, I think that's that's a really fair point in terms of that the delivery is in the define the delivery. It's incremental. So it's it's uh, so, so you may be looking to, to, for example, prove value based on a specific hypothesis. So if it's if it's looking at can we distinguish between algae and dead coral was one um, focus area for us. So it was looking at that from a technolo technology perspective, looking at it from a, a, a user perspective. What are the jobs to be done here? What, where, what are the key barriers in this space? Where are we looking to create additional value? Mapping out flows based on that, then looking to bring it to make that real in a way that we could um, walk users through and like a, an as is and a to be flow. Um, but but always with that longer term view in terms of, okay, how would we then scale this? So that's to your point, your question there in terms of where it's kind of, it almost merges a little bit or it's blurry that we're, we're, we're very much in the define stage, but with a view to the deliver stage. Great. Uh, thanks for that. Um, there's one question came in or, well, actually we're, we're getting flooded with questions. We won't have time to answer them all. Um, but as I said, we'll, we'll put those questions on the Slack channel and I'll invite even to answer them there. But um, let me just read a couple of them and see. Um, I might jump in with the, the team size question. So Alanya has asked, she's asked specifically how many designers were involved with. Can you just elaborate on the team, the full team who were involved? Of course. Um, yes, yeah, so it was for, for, from, a, from a team of all the, the the projects I've worked on recently, the, the, the breadth of the skills that we had on this project was um, it, it was really comprehensive. So we, we had a system designer, we had an interaction designer. Um, my role, I'm from a design background, but worked as a project lead on this particular initiative. We, we then had uh, skills in terms of we had a commercial expert who we, who we worked with. We, we had um, a strategy expert who helped us to to build that um, the, the the partner engagement approach, um, the, the the commercial expert helped us to to make connections with some of the the the, um, the 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 potential partners in terms of what's the value offering for them, what's the 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 right kind of transaction there. Um, also, we worked with we, we did at least three analytics experts that we worked with on on this project who looked at the the image segmentation, so that that emerging technology, of how best to make use of that, what what uh, how that can add value, not just on its own, but when when you've got the AI and the human working together, how that can deliver the, the optimal experience, and then as well as that, we had a software expert looking at the the technical feasibility of delivering on this. So if we're going to create a, a product of all of those specifications that are required. So if, if that was our core team starting out, but then as we grew, we we saw the the need that we were we were working on this project for a given length of time, 
but we also needed to have that view, you know, three years into the future, five years into the future, where do they need to be? Who's going to be working with them to, to, to help them continue progress? So that's why we transitioned the project at a certain stage. We brought in Accenture Development Partnerships who are experts at working on that longer term strategy. Um, also Accenture Applied Intelligence who w once we had brought the, the, the product to, to having all of the user journeys defined, to having the, the, the concepts mapped out, they, they took it to that next stage of, of full scaling. Um, so so the, fr from there, the, the, the team de developed in terms of there was a, a larger software team. There was a, a branding team from, from Fjord Sydney that got involved. And then I met, called out in terms of the awareness piece. That's where um, the advertising agencies, the monkey got, monkeys got involved. So broad range of skills. But for me, it was how closely we were knitted together was key to the success of the project. Great. Now, it is nice to be able to lean on that many different specialities. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And it was, it was really rewarding. It was, it was, and for me, a key learning from that was, if, as designers, if we can stretch to have that level of understanding or at least appreciation for other people's roles and what they do and the value that that can bring of, th I think that's where the magic can happen. That's where there can be that, the, the real kind of sparks can come when, you, when you're, when you're co-creating on opportunities. Excellent. And um, as I said, we do have some other questions, so I will post them into the Slack channel after this. Um, but thank you very much, Stephen. Um, obviously people were interested because questions started coming flooding in there at the end, but, but thank you very much for sharing your story. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, boy. Thank you. So up next, we have Behrad um, Mirafshar, which again, apologies, um, I'm, names are not my strong point, but Behrad will be talking about lean UX process and integrating UX into agile development. And this is a topical conversation that continuously pops up. So I'm very interested to hear um, what Behrad has to say. So welcome. Thanks, Rory. Um, thanks everyone. Hel hello. My name is Berat. I am the founder, owner of Bonanza Design. We are a global UX design studio based in Berlin, Germany. Interestingly, we work with both enterprises and fast growing startups at the same time and help them to design better softwares faster. So I'm going to talk to you about what is Lean UX. But before that, I'm going to talk about a typical problem that pops in uh, agile development process and cause a lot of frustration for UX designers. And then define Lean UX, talk about advantages of it and walk you through our process. And if you have time, I'm going to show you one of our Figma files of a large scale design project that we completed last year and show you how we organize our files. Cool. So most likely you have experience working in such an environment. A scrum process, one to four weeks of delivery, sprint planning, retrospective, and do it all over again. This has caused a lot of frustration for UX designers. Typical complaint is that we cannot do our job. They write. Why? Because in four to four, one to four weeks, you cannot research, discover, test, deliver, and support dev teams. It's been a while that we identified this problem and came up with a solution for it. We realized that building product delivery is only half of agile product development process. There is always a component of discovery, research and testing involved that requires its respectable pl place in this process. So we developed a product discovery 
process that go in tandem with your product delivery process. Delivery, you pay to build. Discovery, you pay to learn. In such a tandem between learning and building, now UX designers can do their job process, can go through a typical design process and do research, testing, prototyping, learning, and iterating. However, there was a problem for UX designers as well. A typical design process is usually, a, you go through a process of researching, learning, prototyping, testing, and releasing. This process did not change since physical product designers designing products. We really couldn't use their process to design software. So we needed to evolve. We needed to come up with a better process for UX design so we can design for softwares effectively. Lean UX design is the result of such goal, so to speak. Lean UX design is designed to work within a product discovery process. So let's dive deep and talk about what is Lean UX. Lean UX has three foundation. It is inspired and based on agile mindset. In within a Lean UX design process, you cannot work forever. You need to work within sprints. A sprint is usually take between one to three weeks. And you need to be able to condense an entire design process within that sprint. That's the first foundation of Lean UX. The second foundation is design thinking. Design thinking is core for Lean UX. Why? Because often a short-sighted view of the problem will lead to ignoring some key actors in the system that play huge role into the success and effectiveness of that system. So we employ design thinking, a systematic view to identify all the key actors in the system. We employ empathy to understand their pain points, goals. And the hope here is if we can establish a deep empathy with the key stakeholders, such as users, customers, this empathy, this deep understanding, we would inform our key product and design decisions effectively. So that's a second pillar of Lean UX. The third pillar is, of course, Lean. And Lean is itself a very interesting term driven from Toyota factory lines. And Toyota revolutionized their process in, during the 80s. Essentially, they've done many things but essentially at the core of their work revolution so to speak was this obsession for reducing waste in their entire product development process so the the their mantra was less reduce waste 
to create maximum impact for our customers. So when we talk about Lean UX, we talk about improving our processes to create maximum impact. So as a Lean UX design practitioner, you need to be iteratively reflect on your design process and improve it. So what are the advantage of Lean UX and why should your company startup adhere and employ such a new mindset? We employ Lean UX because we believe that great products rarely arrive by accident. Rather, they are the result of many rounds of iteration. If your UX design process takes a long while, if it takes you six months to develop a core feature, a big feature, or three months, you really cannot iterate. And often the problem with inexperienced product teams is that they go with their first idea or second idea or first prototype or second design. The key to a great product it lies in iteration and your UX design process needs to allow you to do that. Another big advantage of Lean UX is it helps you to maximize your learning. In 2023, my friends, your key competitive advantage is about learning faster than your competitor, not shipping faster. A lot of product teams want to ship faster because they can expose their product ideas and futures to the market and learn from it. That was a effective strategy, but not in 2023. In 2023, you have an abundance of no code tools out there that help you to release the early version of your product faster to the market. One thing that you want to not also pay attention that not all the learnings that you want you want to gain are equal in terms of cost and efforts. The, learn, the learnings that you gain in the production is costlier than the learnings that you could gain in the pre-built discovery phase. Also, if you launch a future and if it was a mistake, undoing that future is costlier as well. So as a product team, you want to strategically gain most of your learning in the pre-built, in the discovery phase. And Lean UX is perfect for it. It allows you to prototype your ideas as fast as possible and as cheaply as possible. So you can get out there and expose your product ideas at early stages to your target market and learn from it. Talking about product. In 2023, you need to change your perspective of what a product is. In 2022, we've had clients that based off the interactive prototypes that we designed for them, they have raised seven figure investment. They have closed contracts. So if by definition, a product is a systematic workflow that solve a target 
group pain points in exchange for monetary value, the interactive prototypes is the first version of your product. So you can gain a lot of learnings using no code solutions as fast as possible, as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible using it in UX. So I talked about the foundation of Lean UX. It's based on agile design thinking and being lean. I talked about product discovery and how it helps to solve the challenges designers face to work in an agile environment. I talked about the advantage of Lean UX and let's go through a typical Lean UX that we use at Bonanza Design to deliver large scale design projects for our clients. Just for the context here is that at every given time, we usually work on five to 10 different projects. So we use this process iteratively and this process gets optimized based on the learnings that we gain from each of these projects. We follow a three week cycle of learn prototype test. This is, you, call, you can call it a sprint of product discovery. We always start with learning. We use a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods to learn, including expert interviews, customer interviews, user interviews, trend analysis, market research, competitive research. Then in the second week, we jump into prototyping, fast prototyping. And in the third week, we tested with target market. A prototype, it could be an interactive prototype, or it could be a landing page, especially if you're testing a problem solution space, if you're testing, validating a value proposition, right? So it really depends at which stage of product development you are. If you're at early stages, we use landing pages, LinkedIn posts to test these ideas. If you are at later stages, we use wireframes and interactive prototypes. In the testing, we find people relevant, similar to your user personas, and we will test them in the third week. And we conduct this cycle many rounds. And each time that we conduct this round, our prototypes evolve. And important is that when I talk about iteration, I'm not talking about incremental improvements. I'm talking about overhauls, radical change in the way we assume this product should be about. That's the definition of iteration. Why? Because great product rarely arrive by accident. They are the results of many rounds of iteration. Iterate, your iteration must be bold and daring. So in the first week, I talked to you about learning. We learn. However, it's possible. Quant qualitative, quantitative. We usually start with qualitative. Then we use quantitative methods like surveys to test some of our assumptions. In the second week, we start with ideation fast ideation pr process to come up with a round of ideas. We prioritize them and 
Based on those ideas, we develop hypotheses, and for every major hypothesis, we start wireframing. Our early wireframes could be as simple as something like this. This is actually a developed version of a wireframe. So we have wireframes on a stickies that only brief, like br visually, briefly talk about what that idea looks like. This is a much more developed wireframe that you're seeing. And each time we do wireframes, we want to create conversation around the wireframes. In the early stages, we want to do internal testing. We do limited uh, user testing. As we develop our wireframes, we get out there more out of the office and reach out to customers. I'll show you an evolution of this wireframe so you could see it for yourself after many rounds of iteration, what would happen to a design like this. So this was the first version. And after a few rounds of iteration, we have a wireframe like this. And when we develop wireframes, then we get them to test. This tense testing could be interactive prototypes. This testing could be going to a cafe and showing a landing page to a random person and get their impression. But after each round of testing, we create stickies, uh, we gen generate insight, we create affinity diagramming, and we categorize all of our insight that we get from the testings. And we try to, we try to um, basically grade our insight based on the frequency, how many times this insight raised up during the test, uh, more it raised stronger that insight or signal is. And based on the insight that we get from the test, we continue iterating. And this is the high fidelity version of the wireframe that I showed you. Quickly, before I close it and open it to uh, questions, is this is our typical Figma file. I don't know if you see it properly. Um, I hope you see it uh, properly. On the left side, we have different different pages. But let me just like go through one of the pages that you could see what we're doing, especially the research phase, because that's a Achilles heels of um, uh, big of design teams. We create personas, we create one page summary personas. One page summary is because a lot of product leaders that we work with are busy we record all the testings and put it here for review we create a video summary of all the videos too because we know that our product leaders are busy and they cannot go through seven hours but they can go through 20 minutes and then we do inside gathering based on each screen as you can see Insights are color coded. Yellows means doubt, red means negative, green means positive. Emotions next to each stickies. And we do these for all the screens, as you can see. If I zoom out, you could see different rounds of user testing that we conducted. This is one round, this is another round here. This is another round below, and this is another round. As we gather insights, we create an exhibition, and we encourage our product leaders and clients to do random walks. This is an exhibition that we create for them. They can come in, look at all the insights that we conduct and generate in each round of user testing. And hopefully this will inspire them and inform their decisions. Thank you everyone.
this was a bit of an intro on UX and a bit of a showcase on how we conduct research. I hope this was useful to you. I'm more than happy to answer a couple of questions if you have. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Gary is uh, asking some questions here. So th thanks for sharing that. I'm always, I'm always personally really interested to see, like you just showed there, the Figma file of kind of how people structure things. So, so I, um, I, uh, thanks for sharing that. It was really interesting for me. So I've got um, two questions, great points on learning fast. Um, okay, so can you speak to more on how you were able to change a large corporation to think this way? So I, I guess it's, it's a- That's a fantastic question. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens a small, on the small steps. So what we do, we usually pick a very important project that they have, and we try to work with a dedicated team from a corporate on that project. We try to get to result, we try to create a showcase. And as we are getting to success, hopefully on that project, we will try to work with other teams. So we, we start to train few teams in the beginning, and we try to basically plant the seed in some core teams. And then after a time frame between three to 12 months, then we see that a couple of teams or like some teams have been training with these new ways of working. Then we will try to evangelize that process for larger groups of people in that corporate. Great, yeah, change, change is never a quick, <laughs> a quick thing. Um, I, I have one. I, I love that Figma structure you had, but it, it kind of went from personas straight to screens. Do you do an intermediary step before of trying to figure out um, what screens you'll need or, or really understanding the problem space before you get to the step of having screens? Oh, yeah. There is a lot of messiness in between that we don't show in the presentation because these are the exhibitions that we create and is for review of all the uh all the teams of our clients so sometimes like there is like 25 eyes well 25 pairs of eyes go to these figma files and look at um the insights so we try to when we create exhibitions as such we try to be really uh, strategic about the key insight that we are presenting but we usually go through a, a messy process of guessing of who our user personas are then go through ideation, especially on stickies, then go through storyboarding. From the storyboarding, we go through paper ideations, then wireframing, then, then prototypes and interactive ones. So it's a very messy process. That's itself another topic in case Rory you want to invite me for that. I'm more than happy to give a presentation on that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very messy in that, in, in that sense. Okay, great. I was just making sure that um, I wasn't missing something, and so the step is happening, <laughs> or, or many steps. Brilliant. Um, I have a new one here. What are your thoughts on the typical lean UX cat? So I we, think you know, Jeff, Jeff Gothelf. I think it's a fantastic framework, and you should use it if you don't have experience with lean UX. But in the book itself, Jeff says that you can ignore this canvas and do it if you're a practitioner. So always my answer to my UX students here is that use a framework that is tested and is popular because that gives you a framework. And as you gain practice and experience in your process, then you can ignore that framework and do it yourself. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. It's, um... I think they kind of, it's when you become an expert in something, you, you no longer need the crutches or the prompts that, that like the, the beginners need. Exactly. Excellent. Um, well, I think that, that brings us to the end of time. So thank you very much. Um, we're getting some good feedback there for, on the chat that people enjoyed the talk. So, so thank you for sharing. And um, yeah, I think that brings us to an end. So once again, thank you, Bert. My pleasure. So that brings us to the end of our session for this evening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. But I'm going to finish with our, our plug that we, we do at the end. 
this was a free event and it was a small event, but it was to give a taste of the type of things that we, we do and the ways that we try to help teams shift from working in projects to working as autonomous, empowered product teams. We do also have large scale conferences that we run um, in multiple locations around the world. And our next one is coming up in May in New York in our USA conference. We'll be having probably closer to 45 speakers, eight workshops, we're looking at 800 attendees, um, and it's going to be across the full product team. So product managers, UX researchers, designers, developers. And so if that is something that's interesting to you, please do come and join us. Um, it's always great to see new and exciting people there. Um, but that brings us to an end for this evening. So thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.